What is up, everyone? Welcome to Flipping Bats, where today we got the Hall of Famer John Smoltz coming on. It is not Saturday. It is not Saturday with Smoltz. It's the postseason. So we're going to get him when we can, and we're going to get it out as soon as we can. We're recording this on Wednesday. We do not yet know the Game 2 results, uh, but we are going to talk about some of the Game 1 results, managing uh, A.J. Hench's performance against Joe Espada in that series, how Tarek Skubal did. Um, the Mets and Braves. Uh, We have a lot of good stuff coming up, but didn't want to wait till Saturday to put it out because it wouldn't have made a lot of sense. So this is not Saturday with Smoltz. It's sometime with Smoltz. Anytime with Smoltz. I don't know, but here he is. Without further ado, let's get to him now. The Hall of Famer, John Smoltz. All right, I am pumped to be joined as we are every single week by the Hall of Famer, John Smoltz. John, how are we doing this week? Wow, doing good after some crazy, crazy baseball uh and just results so it's all started here we go it is it is playoff baseball season i imagine you're traveling this weekend first saturday of the playoffs for you where are you heading i'm going to la so i've got the dodgers uh and you know so much expected to be for the dodgers going to be a lot of pressure after their rest and five days off to kind of kick back in gear so i'm interested to see the adjustments they make to, to attack their series after, of course, having the best record. Yeah, I, I know we, we've talked about it a little bit over the last year or so, but they're one of the teams that has not figured out having that first round bye, right? The majority of teams that get the first round bye have not. The only team over the last two years that has figured out how to have that bye and it benefit them in advance has been the Houston Astros, who didn't get a bye this year. The Dodgers have had it, and it's never worked. What what can they do differently? What do you think they're doing differently to take this time and not let them adversely be affected? Yeah, that's a great question. I would actually back off of some of the intentional like simulation games that they're trying to do and just create. Yeah. Look, it's harder for the hitters. They don't see the same velocity. They don't see the same intensity. Your brain knows you're not facing somebody that you're going to face but yet you're trying to simulate the scenario so when it shows up, I think mentally you just have to say it's no big deal. You have to train yourself to think it's not that big a deal. The more we have to focus on it, the more you have to talk about it, then the the reality becomes, well, why are we having the best record then? Yeah, You have the best record because you get to rest guys that need rest and you're facing a team that comes in having to use some resources they would have not been able to they would have been able to use in your series so you've got to view it as a major major advantage and i think because the last couple of years it has not gone that way it's now being viewed as a disadvantage you have yeah. to flip that you have to convince your team that this is what we fought for this is what we get to do we are lined up the way we want to line up and there is no reason we can't win three out of five with home field advantage. So I think you have to change the narrative and not put so much in, you know, pressure on, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Just guys understanding they're good and they take their BP and they do what they have to do to be ready yeah. for when the time comes Saturday. Yeah. I, it, it really starts day one with managing in October, October 1st, the calendar switches, managers change and, and something I wanted to ask you about is is being a manager in the postseason versus the regular season. I mean, how how much of a difference do you think, you know, the the second it turns to playoff time? Because I from from the outside, it appears the majority of managers change the way they've managed all year long. That for some reason they get to where they are, they change how they manage. And oftentimes you see it not work out. That's why you see guys like the Bruce Bochy be so successful because he's been through it enough to not push the panic button. But you often see managers, the second it becomes October, think, okay, all hands on deck. I have to change up how I do things. What what do you see from the difference of managers between the regular season and the postseason? Well, the one thing is when you have a system of how you make your decisions and you don't deviate from that system, you're not going to get fired. But if yeah. you deviate from it, uh, you have a higher risk of being fired if it doesn't work out. Absolutely. I've never understood that if it doesn't work out, it's still okay if you don't deviate from your system. <laughs> I've never understood that. 
something in your system must over years have to be recalibrated or thought differently. But I will say this, you have less room for error and the series, especially a best of three, puts you in a tough spot if you lose game one. Yeah. And if you think about everything about the sport is built over a longevity of 162 and yes, a series, it's a mindset issue that you cannot allow yourself to drift. If I lose game one, then you have all the numbers that talk about what are the odds of you winning a series if you lose game one. And that is only in the playoffs. Do you know how many times in a regular season you'll lose game one of a series and go on to win? Like, you've got to shift the thinking and say, this is a best of three. Let's not get carried away with a win or a loss. Let's execute when we are in position to execute. And the bottom line's this. It never deviates rarely do you see a team strike out 16 times and win rarely and you can't live by that model you might win one game you're not winning three so the team that puts the ball in play is going to be the team that has a chance to advance and we've already seen that after one game the teams that struck out the most they lost and that's the way it goes and you know i think that simplistic approach over 162 is not micromanaged that way it's no big deal because unless you're striking out 15 times a game, you're going to lose 120. Yeah. And the teams just don't do that because they don't run into that kind of pitching. So it is micromanaging to the nth degree, but understanding your players that execute, you're going to win. I was thinking about that yesterday. So for all the game ones, and we are recording on Wednesday before we know the outcome of all the game twos. Um, but I was thinking about it when they said, so in the couple of years that this format has been in play, the team that wins game one has won every series of these best of three. And that just got me to thinking like te- teams are just changing up how they do things. And the panic button gets extra pressed because how often in a regular season, as you just said, all you got to do is win two games in a row. That happens all the time, but it's never yeah. happened in this format, which is crazy to me and goes back to exactly what you were just saying. It becomes this massive micromanaging and, pushing the panic button and taking pitchers out too soon as they're getting in a groove because the numbers say to do it. But, you know, oftentimes um, a manager plays a big role in it now. So I, I guess with, with all these teams left from, from your perspective, who are, who are some of the managers? Like I felt, I felt in, in game one, I thought AJ Hinch did an incredible job. I think AJ Hinch has done an incredible job all year with that Tigers team. And he even said, we're going to go scooble and then we're going to go chaos and we're going to figure it out. And I thought he did an incredible job managing in game one. Um, for you, so of the managers that are in October, who do you look at as, oh, that team, I think that team has an advantage because of who they have in the dugout. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We've got only a few uh, managers who have been there a long time. Yeah. And the Dodgers with Dave Roberts, the Braves, of course, with Brian Snicker. And Rob Thompson, it's a heavily National League kind of veteran managers. But even in Milwaukee, first time for Pat, he's done an incredible job. And you start looking around in New York, you got a first-year ma- manager. And then in the American League, first-year manager in Cleveland. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Now, Brett Boone hasn't had as much pleasure in going far enough in the postseason, but he's he's considered more of a veteran manager. With A.J. Hinch, here's the thing. Been there, done that. Extended the rope when he had all this information in Houston and used his gut to finish a World Series. He gained some credibility. He is going to take that information. He's going to use it but he's also going to use what he believes his eyes value his information that he Mm -hmm. gets. I've said this a million times, and I know I get a bad rap thinking that I'm a 100% anti, uh, you know, (laughs) analytics. I am not. I'm just anti 100% analytics. Like if you put it all in one bucket and you don't use anything else, you give me a, you give me a number that's a hundred percent successful. I promise you I'm using it. (laughs) I promise you, but there's no such thing, right? So the probabilities we're using in the leverages of 85 to 90 to 94%. What AJ's doing is a tough way to win a World Series, but it shows you what you can do when you don't have an expectation of a team that's even supposed to be there. You start buying in, players start understanding, and then now it's just a little bit more difficult to win games because you're not relying on – 
horses or people that have been there, done that, you're taking pieces and you're really pulling together what I think is one of the most miraculous runs. Yes, it's only one game, but it's the fact that they got to play in the postseason, yeah. which tells the story. When it comes to AJ, I was thinking this watching the, the Astros-Tigers game, uh, game one on Tuesday. When it comes to AJ Hinch, obviously the storyline's right itself, right? AJ is back in Houston for a playoff series with this new young team that beat all the odds to get to the playoffs. Then they win game one. But I was sitting there watching, obviously, I, I think AJ is a brilliant manager. And to, to go up against a team that you used to manage, how... How beneficial do you think that is to him? How how much do you think he's able to rely on, okay, maybe in, in terms of talking to pitchers or talking to hitters, knowing about other guys, hey, this is how we can get out Alex Bregman. This is how we can get out Jose Altuve. Just taking his experience and using that with his new team, do you, do you think that's factoring in here at all? I think it's huge. I, I think Intel's Intel, and they're going to get it from all kinds of scouting and advanced scouting and yep. all their analytics. I get all that. But when you personally know those players, when you have had personal interaction, you know their heartbeat, you know what makes them tick, you know when they thrive, there's no doubt that has as a manager. Now, if you're telling me, let's say I was a pitcher that played with those guys for six years, and now I'm on the other team facing them, it's similar. I've seen it, but you're not paying attention to every detail. When you're on the same team, you watch your hitters, unless you're specially watching to say one day I might be somewhere else. So I'm going to, you're yeah. going to know those guys. But when you're managing them, you know a lot more about them because of the day to day detail. So I think that's huge. And again, you can pass on that information, but your players have to be able to execute. And when you've got a stud like they have to roll out in game one, it proved what happened. Well, let's talk about that stud. Tarek Skubal, I, in my opinion, has been the best pitcher in baseball all year. I would say he is the current best pitcher in baseball. When you were watching that game or when you watched Tarek Skubal pitch, what do you think? As one of the greatest to ever do it, as a Hall of Fame pitcher, as a guy that took the ball every fifth, sixth day, with all the knowledge you have, when you watch the young Tarek Skubal, who's going to win his first Cy Young Award this year, what goes through your mind? What goes through my mind is that he's creating an edge with the name on the back of his jersey. Every player wants that in sports. Don't It doesn't matter what sport. When you see a certain name, there's a couple things that go through players that are playing, uh-oh, or we got this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the uh-oh factor is he's on the mound, and we sure hope he doesn't have his best stuff. He has command. He has power. He has everything you want to silence a good offense and he's been doing it all year it's not like it's not flukish right and i think the only way you beat a guy like that is he can't, he's he's got to be not on his game and you find a crack somewhere but when yeah. you build that equity and you build that uh-oh factor the hitters at the plate they're not going to be honest and go oh shoot but that's what they're thinking yeah and 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 even though they have the pedigree of a championship organization houston is by far the team of this last decade, the last 10 years, these guys are not faced by anybody. But they know when a guy is legit and they know when he's on. And he was on in game one and there wasn't much they could do about it. I, I don't think it took long for them to realize he was on. I think it was either the first or second inning through a 94-mile-an-hour slider that moved all over the place. And at that point, it's just like, oh, we're, we're in for a long day today. <laughs> yeah, and again, just seeing some of those postseason games – when you got hitters, and, I, and obviously um, I'm following the San Diego and, and Atlanta series because I've got one of those teams going up against the Dodgers yep. that I'll be covering, there were swings and misses that you just don't see very often that were just all over the board because the the Padres pitchers and especially King had his he had it working. Yeah, and and when they're not that when you're not that nasty, and let's just say because it was a different situation and because of the regular season, they were going to take King out after five innings. Do you know how many jumping jacks and somersaults the other team was going to do? Yeah. But they did. They left him in. He did his thing. He shortened the game. He was in command. There wasn't really an issue of I'm going to, I'm on, I'm not going to let him go through the lineup two and a half times when a pitcher is on his game and he's not throwing 120 pitches. You got to let him do his thing. 
And we saw those individual performances in game one already. There's been some spectacular pitching performances. And you know that it's going to be even more condensed in the next couple games because the pressure's on those teams who are down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, to your point, and literally just game one, Scooble, Burns, Reagans, King, all absolutely lights out. I know you mentioned um, you mentioned the Braves who are playing the Padres and the winner of that series uh, you'll have with the Dodgers. But I wanted we talked last week about that doubleheader, Mets, Braves. Um, Mets went on to win their first game after the crazy doubleheader. Braves laid an egg after that doubleheader in their first game. I, I just I was watching it. Just I couldn't help but thinking of of how unfortunate the situation was. And you know it's one sixty two, but they had to play one sixty one and one sixty two in the same day, and then both celebrate in their opposing locker rooms, and then immediately go play where they needed to. Obviously, the Mets were able to win, but I I just don't know when when you were watching that. I, I imagine you tuned in for the majority of the doubleheader and saw what was going on. What were what were your thoughts? What is there? to be done uh, because I, I do think it, I do think it's unfortunate for those teams that immediately had to turn around and go play in this postseason. But uh, I, I just don't know, you know, do we go back to creating a 163 tiebreaker? Do, do you, do you think this was unavoidable? I think it was unavoidable. If it would have been done 10 days ago, uh, there was plenty of time to make it right. So that there yeah. was no game played on Monday. Um, literally, a, a horrific storm came through that just there was no way they could play those games. Now I know people said, well, they should have t- sent those two teams somewhere played in a dome and got them played. That's a real big disadvantage to the Atlanta Braves who had yep. home field. The The reality of every 162 that comes down to this, there was a game or two that every team could speak to that could have avoided this, right? It's just the way the season worked. I mean, the Braves could have been in a much better position had they won on Sunday. Not one game would have mattered. Uh, of that, they would have been punched their tickets, and it would have been about you know the Mets and and the Diamondbacks scenario. So once they lost on Sunday, and once the Mets won, and once you know the Diamondbacks lost on Saturday, that created this total mess. Yeah. Now I will say this: the 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 reality worked out the way we thought. The perception was each team was going to win a game because resources weren't going to be spent in that second game. <laughs> yeah. But it was awfully tight and close for the Atlanta Braves, who ended up winning and then drew the unfortunate task of going to San Diego, flying all night. And that's just part of baseball. And again, it comes down to execution. The teams that get in by the seat of their pants seem to have momentum moving forward, seem to have in the last couple of years created chaos like the Diamondbacks and the Rangers have. And we'll see how it plays out this year. But at some point, that bubble bursts if you don't execute and you're just running on adrenaline and emotion yeah. Here, here's what i will say with that double header i ultimately don't think it made the biggest difference in the game one of the playoffs because the mets won they did things well they were able to pitch the way they needed to got a good enough start and the braves th- their offensive approach just wasn't going to be good enough to win that game anyway michael king had them looking silly it's not like it was a situation where Rysel iglesias had to throw 60 pitches over the last two games you bring him in and he's a different pitcher they didn't get to him. Their approach was right. awful at the plate. Michael King won that game. And I think it all, uh, I think that was a different situation for them. Again, listen, if you live and die by the homer, which we, this is not an, uh, an indictment of the Braves because this offense is fragmented with injuries. It's not the same. You put that last year offense up against Michael King. They may not win, but they're not striking out 15 times either. Yeah. So that that's the thing that, that this offense and their approach is very vulnerable to pitchers who are locked in. They hit a lot of homers and doubles, but they swing and miss a lot. And if the approach doesn't change, or if there's inab- inability for a player to change their approach, this is the one thing I've never understood about the game. Over 162, you know why that hides itself? You're facing fours and fives. Yeah, You can beat up some fours and fives and maybe some threes. You're not beating up the ones and twos like that. So it gets a little confusing when there isn't a philosophy that tells you you need to change your two-strike approach. The philosophy is let three swings rip. You might run into one. And I say good luck doing that in the postseason. (laughs) That's where it changes. It's not the same pitching. It's not the same style. And you're not facing the same guys. That's where it shows itself. 
John, always a pleasure, my friend. Safe travels out here to Los Angeles. What a series that's going to be. Uh, always appreciate it, man. All right, just wanted to thank John Smoltz for joining us here on Flipping Bats. Always, always a pleasure to have him. A Hall of Famer, one of the greatest to ever do it, and means a ton that he comes on the show every single week, including the playoffs when, uh, you know, things get hectic. And that was one of the coolest things for me talking to him about today was the hectic in the dugout with the manager and them pushing the panic button or not. It, it really is. When you watch playoff baseball, everything is different. And you can see that in the manager's faces and the way they go about things is just sometimes, in my opinion, wrong. And it, it is, it's always an interesting game to watch them play and, and do things differently than they did in the regular season. You play 162 games. And then the second the, the calendar turns to October, you do things differently than what got you here. And I've never felt like that's the right way to go about things. But um, really good conversation, as always. He is out here now for the Dodgers series and uh, what is sure to be a great NLDS. But thank you all for listening. We will be back. As I mentioned, schedule is going to be a little bit different in October. Obviously, had Tuesday's episode. So if you haven't listened to that, go check it out. It's the full playoff preview. Everybody that I think wins every series all the way up to the World Series. Uh, top storylines from the playoffs, all that stuff. Obviously, today is John Smoltz and planning to have another one come out uh, perhaps on Saturday this week. So schedule's a little bit different. I'll keep you posted on social media and, and everywhere, really. So I appreciate you all for listening. As always, make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Spotify. You can also watch on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is Flippin' Bats Pod. Uh, watch it. Leave a comment. I love uh, hopping in there, commenting back, having a conversation with you guys afterwards. Uh, always love that. So check that out. We're on all social media as well at Flippin' Bats Pod. But until next time, my friends, appreciate you for watching and listening. Remember, find your bat and flip it. Enjoy the postseason.